we invited Michelle Wisdom to come and speak with us about how to do a pollinator friendly lawn. And she is a recruiter and special projects coordinator at the University of Arkansas in the Department of Horticulture. I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you guys about pollinator friendly lawns. You can have it all. You can have a beautiful turf grass situation and flowers that feed pollinators. The first thing that I want to talk to you about today is that lawns help pollinators if they provide flowers. Flowers are food for pollinators. The pollen is the protein, the nectar are the carbs. This is the full form of nutrition for a pollinating insect. And basically that's it. Pollinators need flowers to survive. Pollinators require diverse floral resources to maintain health and also a season long succession of flowers for nutrition. So this just means lots of different flowers to choose from and flowers from as early in the spring to as late in the fall as possible. Five years ago, I went to Minnesota for my college internship. Um, you know, I just took off and left my husband and son to their own devices for a summer. I just said, keep my chickens alive and do not burn down the house. And, and I took off and I worked on something called the bee lawn. And I'm sharing this with you today because when I was in Minnesota, we incorporated seed into cool season turf grass. This was fine fescue. The reason I'm talking about broadcasting seed is because at Arkansas, when I came back home, I put actual plants into Bermuda grass. But in this project, we used clover, wild thyme, and self-heal. And we tried five different treatments, but what I want you all to know is that the treatment that we found the most success with was just scalping the turf grass to one inch and then broadcasting the seed into that system. So just, you know, your turf grass at one inch is very short, but it really guaranteed good seed to soil contact. So five years later, here it is, the bee lawn at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. You see a really nice stand of clover. We see wild thyme still persisting in this fine fescue. What we did not see much of anymore, do not see much of anymore is self-heal and self-heal is a medicinal herb in Arkansas it did quite well in Minnesota not quite so much so um, you know we've kind of eradicated many food sources for pollinators as we've transitioned from what you see in this picture to kind of a more uniform look you know almost a monoculture of turf grass but I don't see any you know problem with this I, I think this is a beautiful picture so when I came back to Arkansas my master's projects were systems to attract and feed pollinators in warm season lawns. And so the larger picture on the left is self-heal, which kind of died out in Minnesota. It is an herbaceous perennial, a forb, that we put into Bermuda grass. And then my bigger study is the smaller picture. It was putting early spring flowering bulbs into Bermuda grass and buffalo grass, so warm season turf grasses. But I wanted to fast forward really quickly to my results. And then after this, I'm gonna show you some cool pictures of our work. So as you can see for pollinator friendly lawns, you can have it all. If you incorporate early spring flowering bulbs into your turf grass, and then you combine your herbaceous perennials, you can have a season of flowering from January through October. So, you know, why use bulbs? This work is by my major professor, Dr. Mike Richardson here at the University of Arkansas. He is a turf grass scientist. He just wanted to see if early spring flowering bulbs could persist in warm season turf grasses. In this case, it was zoysia grass, which is a very thick, dense turf grass known to suppress weeds. And he just wanted to see if bulbs could persist, if they could add color to the dormant turf grass in the winter time. And also he wanted to see if bulbs would be damaged by an application of pre-emergent herbicide. And as you can see here, you know, the bulbs, yes, they definitely added color. He tried four species of bulb 
one did persist over time. I think they are still, I mean, this was 2010 to 2014. I think they're still out there. And he was published in Hort Technology. I mean, it's kind of a quirky little project, you know, his science fair project, but um, people saw value in it and it was published. This was published in 2015. This is right when I came back from Minnesota and I started my own work. And so I just broadened his study. I tried 30 species of bulbs. And then we added this pollinator aspect. So flowering bulbs. I mean, what's the deal with flowering bulbs? They are geophytes. So this means that it's a plant that has an underground storage unit or storage structure, which holds nutrients and water. They are dormant for most of the year. And, you know, then they'll just throw up a flower, throw up some foliage, they'll put on their show, and then they will die back and go back underneath the ground. So they're very inconspicuous. Richardson was worried that they were going to interfere with his turf grass systems. They do not. They're really cool because they're variable in their size, shape, and bloom times. And some are known to naturalize over time. So this is what my plots look like the first year and for, for subsequent years. This is in Bermuda grass. And what we did find was that these early spring flowering bulbs fed pollinating insects. So clearly over here on the left-hand side, you see a honeybee drinking nectar from the grape hyacinth. On the right, you see a honeybee collecting pollen from this crocus. Some of our bulbs persisted in turf grass, but it didn't feed pollinators, and that was like daffodils. Some persisted in a raised bed, which was our control, but they didn't persist in turf grass, and these are two examples. So we have Iphion on the right, and we have Hyacinth on the left, obviously feeding honeybees, but they just couldn't take those turf grass systems. And we established a succession of flowers that fed pollinators from January through March. And I got published in Hort Science this past fall, which we were very excited about. So Forbes, this was my second study. This was just adding herbaceous perennials, or we call them weeds, to Bermuda grass to see if they would persist and feed pollinators. Here we've got the smaller picture is clover and trefoil. The larger picture is self-heal. This was the entry in Minnesota that kind of died out. I had eight entries. The yellow arrows indicate the entries that did not make it. These pooped out pretty quickly. So it was the bird's foot trefoil, English daisy, and subterranean clover. But of the things that did make it, one of my favorites is spring beauty, Claytonia virginica. These flowered from February through April. And then our clovers, white clover and strawberry clover, flowering from March through July. And you can clearly see the pollinators foraging on that white clover. Self-heal. So in Minnesota, it kind of died out. But in Arkansas, it suppressed Bermuda grass. And when I say suppressed Bermuda grass, I mean there was 100% coverage of self-heal. Like I couldn't see a blade of Bermuda grass in my self-heal plots, which was pretty shocking to us. So these flowered from July through October. So with our Forbes study, we established a succession of flowers from February through October. And again, for pollinator friendly lawns, if you combine early spring flowering bulbs with these herbaceous perennials, weeds, whatever you wanna call them, you can feed pollinators from January through October. And with that, here are some resources. 